different um, environments. We come from very different kinds of institutions. Uh, we are all as a group at very different points in our career trajectories and, and may have very different relationships to digital culture, digital technologies, the digital humanities. Um, if you were like me, you may have changed institutions a few times and seen those unwritten rules shift significantly. Uh, when I worked at a, at a large public uh, state institution, uh, this whole press to do something digital was very immediate, right? It was like, but, but often the people saying do something digital had very little idea of what that might be. Um, it was like, but use a computer in it. Surely that will be better, <laughs> right? Um, so we thought that this would be really, uh, this opening would be a nice opportunity to kind of articulate some of the ideas that we've been working on uh, for the past several years, both individually and together. David, of course, uh, has a long career as a leader in this field. Um, and so to kind of orient ourselves around some kind of key ideas and vocabulary and readings. Um, one other kind of idea about the readings, um, like any educational institution, I think the readings are ambitious um, <laughs> uh, in their amount and density and in our expectations of the thoroughness with which you will absorb, retain, and process all of those readings. And we cut them down significantly. <laughs> <laughs> True that. Um, so what I want to, I'll tell you what I, what I often uh, used to tell my graduate students, which is, uh, you know, read for what's useful to you. Uh, you know, uh, learn what not to read, uh, and, um, and, and our expectations will kind of ebb and flow as we go. These are in large part about kind of orienting you to different aspects of the field um, and the concepts and are really there as resources and references that hopefully will go far beyond the institute. Some of them may also be familiar to you. Um, some of them uh, you may vigorously disagree with. I certainly do. Uh, and so we really welcome that. So, you know, if my hope is that everybody's read part of everything um, as a community, as a collective, and we can kind of base our co conversations on Just that. Just to pick up on that too, the, in general, the, the readings are most important for the seminars, because right? that's, that's a real discussion. Um, so as opposed to the lectures, which are, you know. Lectures. Lectures. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and believe me, the irony of the lecture format, um, <laughs> for you watching along, right, uh, as being profoundly yes non-interactive, non-immersive, and uh, you know, following, you know, following a method that is, you know, roughly 2,000 years old, um, is not lost on us. Okay. Um, so the 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 kind of areas of the institute that we're that we're thinking about really circulate really circulate around um, a, a few core concepts, which you of course understand um, and know. Right. One is this this concept of the digital, and we'll talk about the kind of valences with that word. Um, in, in a number of different ways. Criticism, or right, what we could have written was like simply studies. Um, I should also say that all of these slides and their references will be made available to you, right? So um, don't feel like you have to write, to the, like my undergrad, right? Don't feel like you have to write down what is on every slide. Um, we will make all of that available to you. Um, and then of course, performance is a large, uh, a large category. Uh, often in the, in the Institute, we, we tend to focus more on things that we would talk about specifically as theater or theatrical, um, but, but in which personally I include dance, but using a kind of broad spectrum of performance studies um, as well to think about how does digital culture often perform? How does the digital intersect with notions of performativity and how, um, and how that plays out? And so really, I mean, I think all of us right now no matter you know, kind of where you come from can probably point to a pretty um, rich, comprehensive body of literature at the intersection of any two of these circles, right? I mean, I think many of us have trained in kind of history theory criticism of performance in one form or another. Some of us may also have investigated the digital humanities um, kind of at the level of, of, of digital criticism, um, uh, scholarship and, and theory. Uh, and, and another group of us is particularly invested in digital performance, right? How technologies manifest um, in different ways on stage, how they change our relationship to spectatorial perspectives, for example, things like that. What we're really aiming for in this institute is to kind of like really s focus our attentions at the center of these, right? To talk about these three domains uh, as a kind of nexus uh, for each other and how they, in different kinds of work and in different kinds of moments, press and change and, and bend each of these respective concepts to, to each other. You want to jump in here? I believe this is you. Yeah. 
Aha, uh -huh. okay, yes. So um, at this particular moment in 2018, uh, technology has become, has permeated every aspect of our culture and it's become quite commonplace in all different types of performance settings and people who don't have access to various different kinds of media technologies now desperately want it, they're hiring people to, to start adding it. Uh, many of you were around not that long ago when that was not the case. Um, so uh, I think it's useful to see, to historicize a lot of the issues that we're dealing with uh, and uh, to uh, point to some basic intuitions that have recently been shifting and identify where those intuitions came from. A lot of the readings and discussions are engaged in these debates that are constantly, the premise of which is constantly shifting. Um, so uh, really the period in the 1990s was really key as I'll be, you know, uh, Steve Dixon's book on digital performance and the whole digital performance archive that uh, he was involved in creating focused on that radical paradigm shift. Um, and those of us that were around in the, the 90s might remember that there, were, there was a lot of, of experimentation with the use of media and specifically digital media in performance. There was a lot of excitement about it. It was also extremely controversial. And I was involved with it pretty early on. I was very lucky uh, because I ended up in institutions, not coincidentally, that were really interested in pursuing that. But I remember talking to a lot of people saying, wow, you know, nobody at my institution would, wants to go anywhere near that. They, they think it's an awful thing to combine media with performance. You know, that, and, it's, you know, that, and it's hard to even remember that mindset, you know, because it's, so, it's really inverted. Um, so it's interesting to think back, all right, well, why exactly did that a change occur in the 1990s? Uh, and it happened, you know, in general, that willingness to embrace different types of media with live performance, which is a broader issue, came about with the rise of the digital. And it could simply be a coincidence, but I don't think so, for a number of deep reasons. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. All right. Um, so uh, I think to step back, you need to think, um, you know, and, uh, why did the separation happen in the first place, right, between media and performance? Um, for much of the 20th century, it was extremely rare to combine uh, media with performance. There were some significant exceptions that I'll be pointing to later on, but for the most part, it was uh, unusual. And in the 90s, there were two things that happened, I think, uh, that, that resulted in the shift. Um, one specifically related to the digital, it was very, very pragmatic. It simply became a lot easier to integrate media and performance. So if you think back to the 70s, uh, when Svoboda you know, was one of the first to be using it, he was using film, right? And a lot of the earlier productions were using actual celluloid, which is much, much harder to film and develop and then project. Uh, and it really wasn't until the 90s that we had, you could create the media, edit the media much, much more easily, uh, and then project the media. And even I remember the first production that I did that used computer technology when I was a st uh, grad student in the 80s, used this horrible limelight projector. Anybody remember those? Is the, you know, and by the early 90s, you could really get access to the sort, you know, decent projectors of the sort that we have now. So, so there's certainly that pragmatic explanation, but I think there's a more interesting um, conceptual one. So the next, uh, uh, all right, so if we go to the, the next slide. All right, the cultural explanation. Uh, and this is something that uh, if you're, uh, many of you have been dealing with your own art forms and dealing with the, the rise and fall of modernism. And I'm really curious to get your thoughts about this, but it's somewhat reductive, but I think nonetheless true explanation has to do with the shift in fundamental modernist assumptions. So as we all know, around you know, at the end of the 19th century, we get you know, the development of this strong high modernist movement where in all the art forms, whether it was in the visual arts or in music or in architecture, there was this drive to find the purity of the art form. Painting needed to be not, you know, not about anything but painting, right? So you get rid of the figure, you get rid of representation, you, you, you simply have paint on the canvas. You need to get to the essence of each art form. Buildings needed to be about structure and form and the building itself. Uh, and the same thing, um, you know, of course, happens with theater and other art forms. They each try to define themselves essentially, right? So, next slide. yeah, next slide. So, um, so each film and, and 
theater, when film develops at the end of the 19th century, just with the rise, this, you know, when this, this idea of modernist, this sort of formal essentialism became entrenched, film had to define itself as a unique art form, not simply as a recording of theatrical events. Um, and one of the narratives that has become particularly uh, powerful uh, in the le latter half of the 20th century, in both theater and in film studies, and it's a narrative that permeates a lot of you know, the, the textbooks that we all use when we teach theater, the brackets and that kind of thing, uh, was Nicholas Vardik's uh, really influential and now quite controversial uh, argument. So uh, I'm sure most of you are really familiar with this. Is, are, is anybody not familiar with Vardik? It's fine. Okay, so it's in a real super nutshell. But Vardik argue, you're going to be familiar with the basic argument, though, I think, if you've taken any theater history, is that from the Renaissance on, there was a growing, again, this is Vardik, this is a quote, there is this growing um, movement towards scenic realism, towards uh, creating an illusionistic stage behind a proscenium. Uh, so you look through the frame, and you look, the, and you get the, you know, Diderot's idea of the fourth wall, and then the box set, and melodramas, and, and antiquarian Shakespearean production, all of these things were moving together to create a picture frame that you look through into an alternate reality. Wagner and the Great Divide and blackening the house. And in effect, what Vardik was saying is you, the theater was creating cinema, that it was creating that frame. And by the end of the 19th century, that was the aesthetic. And then cinema comes along at the perfect moment, culturally, to pick that up and then take it to the next level. So you actually have the screen and you can have mountains and, and you know, all sorts of you know, battles and, and battlefields. So it took over that game. And in fact, the you know, cultural deterministic as well as the technological deterministic argument would be it, the technology didn't give rise to that aesthetic, but the aesthetic gave rise to the technology, right? The people needed cinema by the 19th century. They developed it. And so then theater is left, well, it doesn't you know, want to just be a second-rate cinema, right? At that game, it's not as good at it. So it had to do 180 degree and say none of those, you know, scenic realism is not at all what we're interested in. And so the innovators in theater started pursuing something else. So we have on the film side, next slide. So on the film side, you have a deeply entrenched anti-theatricality in film theory that begins from the very beginning. So people like Panofsky uh, you know, uh, argued the imitation of a theater performance with a set of stage, fixed entries and exits and distinctively modern uh, literary ambitions is the one thing film must avoid. So the worst thing to uh, accuse a film of being was theatrical, right? Uh, film was the anti-theater. And, uh, and uh, so film uh, uh, theory then uh, elevated editing and directing over the pro-filmic the, the pro -filmic elements, the things that are there before you start filming them, uh, like mise-en-scene, set design, and acting. All right. So those were theatrical things in the study. And the focus in film was the construction of this this visual text through editing. And of course, the Kuleshov effect, which uh, I'm sure you've all seen, is the perfect back at the very beginnings of film theory, 1910s, you know, he develops this idea. So you've got the one image, so it's no, you don't need an actor at all. You just have the face. And if you juxtapose it with something else through the editing, then we infer different emotions. So in this case, the first image with the uh, dead body would be, uh, you get sadness, and then you've got the food, so we get he looks hungry, and you get this, course, wonderfully erotic figure, uh, and we have lust. So these are his arguments. And on the same side, uh, at the same time as theater, uh, you have the uh, same effort to separate theater from film, right? So theater isn't simply just a cheap, poor person's film medium. It's doing something radically different. It has nothing to do with film. It's about the presence of the actor, right? Uh, and then, uh, so we have key figures like Coupeau, going back to Commedia and forms of you know, play and theatricality. Of course, uh, uh, Artaud, uh, you know, talking about the presence of the actor. Grotowski, the total act, absolute presence, poor theater, stripping away any illusionism, stripping away anything but the raw encounter between one human being on the stage and human beings in the audience. And then, of course, performance art, which takes us even further and then uh, rejects the theatricality of the theater events in the same ways that, say, painting was rejecting the figure, we're not about representing, we're about the real body, my real body here with you. There's no fiction, there's no character. It's just here, it's now. Alan Capro emphasizing that with his happenings, it can never be repeated. It's just raw, absolute presence. So you get that cult. 
All right, so I actually go back. There is the famous, so within media theory, uh, you know, a very famous quote uh, from Peggy Phelan, uh, performances only, life is in the present, performance cannot be saved, recorded, documented, or otherwise participate in the circulation of representations of representation. Once it does, it becomes something other than performance. And she writes this in 1993, which is just at that critical moment when these ideas are about to become radically challenged. And this, this of course, became uh, the other side of the philoslander liveness debate. And by now, you know, actually many years ago already, Peggy said, I said that then, I don't even believe it anymore. People are going to make about it. <laughs> um, OK, uh, next slide. Um, so I would say that in the 90s, there were actually three paradigm shifts that uh, dealt a pretty decisive blow, I think, to this divide, especially from the performance and theater side. The film studies is still, there's some key wonderful exceptions, uh, like people like Brewster and, and Gunning, but uh, m much film theory still is, there's a certain anti-theatricality to it. But within the theater side and the performance studies side, there's been a pretty wide embrace of media as performance. Um, and I think there are three things that affected that. One was in the 70s and 80s, semiotics and structuralism. Uh, it was, of course, all the rage, and you, you know, there are some of the, the key texts in that field initially in the continent and, and, in, uh, and then coming over to the United States and in England. Um, and the argument there was that this idea of presence that, that you know, runs through the history of the 20th century and was articulated by Peggy Phelan was totally naive. There were, everything is a sign, everything is a text, Nothing, you know, so that's, so, and that's where we actually began with this huge rift between theory and practice, and organizations like ATHA suddenly started getting worried about how do we bring theory together with practice, which didn't used to be such a big issue, uh, but at that point, the theorists would all look at the practitioners who were still doing Stanislavski, or maybe if there were experimental, uh, you know, uh, open theater or Grotowski, all of that was like so naive, you know, so he's speaking totally different languages. Um, so that was one blow doubt. And then the second shift with post-structuralism is much more radical because it challenges the whole binary opposition. So it's not simply saying everything is text or everything is a sign or everything is live. It's saying that whole binary opposition between liveness and text is deeply problematic but unavoidable. Right? That's sort of part of the structuralist thing. You can't simply say it's wrong, uh, but it's deeply problematic. Um, so with deconstruction, of course, Derrida was, was one of the key figures with deconstruction. And his deconstruction of, of presence, of presence and absence and speech and writing, which was, of course, all the rage in the late 80s and 90s and fell very much out of favor in critical theory. We don't talk about it very much. But it remains the bedrock. Actually, I was just talking with Phil Oslander about this, just to see, because I've been saying this for years, and I went, I wonder if he would disagree. He said, no, I don't disagree with that. Uh, it's true. You don't, you, Derrida, I don't think he cited once in liveness. Uh, but he is the underlying paradigm of the whole thing, this deconstruction of presence and act. And so with Phil, um, you know, who will be here later this week, um, you know, really formulated the current debate of liveness. Uh, and he started off back in 86, before he you know, started talking, using that term liveness, with the, most, the one really explicit use of, of Derrida, just be yourself, logocentrism and the difference in performance theory where he makes this exact argument about the naivete, the problematic nature of um, you know, Peter Brook and Stanislavski and Grotowski and even Brecht all have these naive ideas of presence. But he simply, he doesn't just invert them and say everything is a sign, it's not that simple. There's, they have to have this idea, but everything in deconstructive practice uh, practice everything that they say is unique to presence is already always already present in media and vice versa and that's the core idea really of liveness it's not saying nothing is live it's saying media is live and live performance is mediatized uh, that there's no way to distinguish between the two uh, and then Matthew Causey uh, was another one who uh, actually this started out as his dissertation in the 90s very much part of you know Baudrillard and, and Derrida using that kind of critical theory and that kind of, and Heidegger in his case as well uh, to challenge this notion of liveness. Um, and then the third, uh, and the, there's overlap between these of course, is uh, the paradigm shift would be posthumanism, moving beyond 
uh, the idea of the human subject as this distinct and unique thing, which underlies this whole idea of the co-presence of the body. We're authentic. We're you know we're here. We're in the now. Uh, technology is you know if we want a poor theater, so no role for technology, no role for media. Well, once you challenge the boundaries between the human self and technology, and there are lots of theoretical apparatus phenomenology was a big part of this. Marlo Ponti talks about the you know. Uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan, in terms of his media theory, talking about technologies as extensions of the self. This idea that, this, that, that the organic can't be separated from technology anymore. Um, and so we get you know, really key seminal figures. Uh, so, of course, Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto back in 84 uh, was a text that was frequently cited. This manifesto really was a very, very effective. It was exactly that. It was a manifesto. Um, uh, Catherine Hales, who you'll be reading, and I think uh, Sarah will be talking about in a second too, how we became post-human, uh, moving that into literary studies. And then within our field, of course, Jen Parker Starbucks, Cyborg Theater, which was published in 2014, but she'd been working in that again for, throughout the 90s, developing these ideas, challenging the boundaries between the human and technology, and in a very logical way, very quickly extending that now into animal studies. Uh, just def you know, defying that rigid, that rigid box of the, the human. All right. Um, so next slide. Then we shift to digital television. television. Okay. All right. So now on to Sarah. <laughs> so this, if you sort of follow the kind of arc of this of this history and evolution, this more or less brings us to what we might think of as a, a kind of you know critical moment of of our own, right? The sort of uh, evolution of the last few years of this emergence of digital scholarship. Um, and, and digital scholarship, digital humanities is a, is a phrase that's been used quite extensively. Um, it, it, it reminds me very much, the whole debate around um, digital humanities reminds me very much of, uh, of the avant-garde and the constant need to keep redefining what that means, right? So every time you bring that up in a context, it's like, and this is how it means, and this is what it means, and how I'm using it. Um, and we see something very similar in, in, in the digital humanities, it, it's, a, it's a kind of and it has a lot of similarities to the way that performance studies formed as a, as a discipline or anti-discipline, right? It's a kind of loose confederation of, of folks who come in and out from different aspects and highlight different um, concepts within it. Um, I think it's helpful for our discussions to ground it in a few preliminary definitions, which we can then use as a motive to contest and, and, and resist if we want. Um, but the most primary, of course, is this notion of it being grounded in the digital, um, which, right, as we can all sort of imagine, has something to do with computers, right? Um, and binary language, that there is some kind of shift that happens in the way that we're approaching this. Um, there's a very interesting in the Theater and series, the Theater and the Digital by Bill Blake, really avoids defining the digital, right? Which is sort of ironic, I think, for a book that uses that as in, in half its title. Um, but it's precisely because this is a kind of, right, what uh, the Dutch theorist Michael Ball called a traveling concept, right? It's something that, that moves and, 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 and is rather fluid in its, in its evolution. Um, we can also kind of anchor it in, in particular kinds of, of aspects of popular cultural, culture, social media, or the so-called Web 2.0, um, this notion of dig digital documentation um, that goes along. It's kind of the, the flip side of the use of projections and, and, and robots and uh, digital technologies in performance. Right, and then that becomes this kind of key marker of how we are assessing, recording, and understanding the field going forward. Um, and I think the, the, the most important thing here is, the, is this quote from Charlie Gere in, in 2002, which is this idea of the digital not just being about technology, but also being about a kind of shift in cultural mindset. Right? That it has something to do with a kind of collective zeitgeist in the way in which we are engaging. And we're seeing the digital pop up in uh, increasingly relevant ways in social theory. So, for example, there's a book from 2017 um, by um, Nick Coldry and Andreas Hepp called The Mediated Construction of Reality. Um, and this is a, a, a fairly extensive work of, of social theory that really, in, in following with, with everything that David was just talking about and sort of move from structuralism to post-structuralism um, and then post-humanism, uh, makes the argument that there's no, there's no longer any such thing as face-to-face -face interactions, right? That when we talk about social theory, we can't talk about people in social communities or social relationships as being completely unmediated, right? That now, because the context in which we all 
operate. And that is, you know, is regardless of what our actual access to technology is, because we are working within structures and systems that are themselves formulated by and shaped by and responding to various kinds of medial pressures, right, both resistant and capitalistic. Um, and in that context, none of us can kind of get a kind of intellectual outside, right? So everything is kind of permeated by this. And I think this is where a lot of uh, theater and performance theory has been really interesting in terms of negotiating, okay, so what is happening in that social interaction, right? How do, you know, when we think of theater as perhaps the world's first social media, right? This kind of social gathering that also has layers of artifice and representation and is an interactive community that also follows certain rules and those rules are dynamic and change. How do we understand these kinds of parallels and similarities to, to one another? Um, so this is, these are kind of um, pointing out the history um, of the ways in which um, theorists and thinkers have been approaching uh, the digital humanities. Um, there's a, if you are interested at all, there's a, a Matthew Gold's Debates in the, Di in the Digital Humanities, which is an excellent kind of edited collection. Um, I believe it was just published in its second or third edition from 2014 or tw even 2016 maybe. Um, but there's also an online website in which the, the sort of debates continue, right? So there was this um, combined, and, and Matthew Gold is the head of digital humanities at the CUNY Center, um, doing a lot of really interesting work at the intersection of, of computer technologies. And in fact, there's an overlapping digital humanities conference um, last week and this week. Uh, there, so I've been tweeting back and forth with, with folks like Kali Wesserling and, and, uh, and other folks there. Um, but sort of highlighting that this is not necessarily a brand new form of scholarship, that in some ways, right, digital technologies and computers almost from their inception have been used in service of the humanities and, in, and even in, um, in, in works of theater history like the, the, the London Stage, um, History of the London Stage Database. Um, Derek refers to that in his really excellent, um, was it Average Broadway, am I remembering that correctly? Um, um, essay from, from Theater Journal in 2016. Um, and other folks have pointed um, to this as well. Um, one of the other leading figures of, of digital humanities that I found really interesting is Kathleen Fitzpatrick, um, who uh, really came to the digital humanities when she was working on, on a book that she had a tremendous difficult uh, time uh, publishing. Um, and everybody agreed, you know, that it was really, uh, they were very enthusiastic about her work, but she kept running it into this whole question of, well, uh, but there's no market for it, right? So it was really hard to get it to come out in, in print. She's told the story in, in a number of different ways. So she moved to an online format, right? She basically published the book and she opened it up for comments and then eventually she did publish it in a, in a print version, but it, it moved her towards this idea of what uh, would then become the commons, right? So she was then in charge of the MLA commons for a number of years. I believe she's moved back into a, an academic teaching position now. Um, but in that book, she laid out the thinking um, sort of, used, sort of in, in, the, in its evolution from say like the late 90s is, uh, and the early 2000s where, where David kinds of leaves off to its thinking as we move into the, the 20 teens and beyond. And if you look at this, she's, right now she's describing literary scholarship, right? She's talking about the shift in literary scholarship. What's, I think, significant for us is that this shift makes scholarship start to look a lot like theater, right? Um, product to process, individual to collaborative, right? Text to something else, the idea of intellectual property to it, right? And so, and if you read more deeply, I'm sort of pulling out her kind of, you know, highlights, but if you read more deeply in that work, there's a real resonance between what's happening in the digital humanities and what theater and performance studies have been doing for 100 years or more. Right? Um, so much so that, that without, um, without irony, Tom Scheinfeld in a, in a blog post, um, I believe from like 2005, 2006, talked about the digital humanities as the performative humanities um, and said like, oh yes, because we're no longer writing texts, we're making projects and works that are interactive and have audiences and, and, and speak in this way. So, so there's a sense of like, you know, everything old is new again um, as we kind of move into it. And then the, the, the other dimension that I think is really important, um, and this is, this is one of, the, of my ideas, so I'll put this out here and then open it up for contestation, um, which is that I, I think these, uh, the, the impact of the digital humanities and theater performance studies really um, break down in the scholarship in, in kind of three broad categories. One is that it changes the way that we collect evidence, 
right? So how we understand what we see, how much we can see. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, you know if, if you, like me, were taught, like, all theater is local, right? It's always an immediate experience. Um, but you live, I don't know, in rural coastal Maine, for example. Mm -hmm. um, getting to see, you know, getting to see the local experience of a lot of theater is very difficult, right? So I rely a lot on NT Live. I rely a lot on, uh, you know, Broadway HD. Um, I use this a lot in my teaching, right? All of a sudden, there's a whole avenue of theatrical viewership that is available through digital technologies. The second, and this is really, I think, speaks, um, is what, uh, you know, Derek's work, I think, is really at the, at the cutting edge of this, is how then, it also changes the way we analyze these materials, right? That we can ask different questions, we can explore different domains. Um, one of the, the uh, sort of sections of readings is from Franco Moretti, um, and his highly influential book, Distant Reading, which made the argument that we should stop reading individual texts. And he's being, I think, I hope, slightly hyperbolic there. Um, but, the, um, but because the, we are missing so much, right? And this is a similar idea to what, what Derek argues in, in Average Broadway, where he talks about all the, that the bulk of Broadway we ignore. Right? That most of that history we pay absolutely no attention to because things closed, they were bad, they became obscure, right? They sort of, and so how do we recover it? So it's, it changes not only what we collect, but also then how we analyze um, this material. And the third major kind of critical area of this is, right, which is that digital technologies help us tell the stories of the history of theater, uh, the theories uh, that we're working through in different domains. So you see the rise of online courses like MOOCs, right? The massively online, um, what does the second O stand for? Open. Open, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, courses, we see, you know, I don't know, the use of PowerPoint in lecture slides, uh, right? So there's a whole different domain in how we, in how we disseminate our work, how we, how we share it. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Um, when we were putting the slide together, I had, I had tucked visualization and simulation in here with, uh, with uh, presentation and publication. And, um, and, and David then took that slide and like put it all in red. He's like, well, actually, you know, <laughs> this. And he's absolutely right. Like when we start talking in sort of pure uh, digital environments, right? When we start looking at digital, that the products and the process that comes out of this kind of scholarly pro um, project, like we actually get all three, right? That you can use digital simulations to become methods to that collect data, um, that analyze that data, um, and that represent that data. Right? Um, and so we see this kind of you know, mixing together. So it might be artificial in some instances to separate them out, and different techniques will fit into, into different domains. Um, there are a few different examples of this, right? So if we think about sort of online archives, and again, um, Phil Auslander's most recent work really touches on this notion of documentation. Um, right? New resources in terms of what we can show um, and what we can do. My, one of my favorites is, is on the boards.tv from the Seattle-based company. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with this, it's a, it's a really wonderful uh, database. Um, it's beautifully shot. It's one of the better, to my mind, documented uh, performance. It's all contemporary performance that's playing it on the boards. Um, so it's not as frequent as other, uh, and it's not as, 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 as varied. You don't get as much material, but it's all exquisitely done. Um, and what's really interesting is in the, in the case of some performances, you will see things in the, digital, uh, in the digital recording that you won't see if you saw it live. So for example, when I was there for the Astor conference, um, I saw Ralph Lemon's How Can You Stay in the House and Not Go Out All Day. And, um, and there was this, uh, a scene where Okwe Okofasili um, is, like, has this like, 10 minute like, keening, right? this like, incredibly powerful weeping. Um, much of it from the physical audience um, you hear her in the space, but you see an empty stage, right? So there's this like experience of grief and loss, and what you are witnessing is pain, or you are hearing is pain, and what you are seeing is absence. In the video, they cut to her where she is, and so there's this there's this going back and forth between the empty space and her as a as a as a figure in a body. And I was like, oh, so that's what she was doing, <laughs> right? Which raises some really interesting question, which is like, what is the what does it mean to have watched that performance? Can I say that I watched it if I saw it live and I never watched the digital version and I never saw where she was or what she was doing? If I had only seen the digital version, 
right? Um, would I, could I say I, I had seen it, right? But I would have missed like the, the, the feeling, like the sweat and the, and the heat that was in that space and what it is to hear another live human being like profoundly weep, right, in the same, in the same room. Um, so this raises some really interesting, in, interesting questions as well. Um, they, we also, one of the other things that I've been really interested in is video annotation. I've been having my students do more, um, more work um, in a very rudimentary way with, with looking at, at, at annotating video, and there are a number of, of platforms in which this happens. Um, Derek Miller, right, I think is a great, uh, this, is, uh, this is probably old Whoa. off your website. Um, I've been trotting this one around for a while. Because um, it's so colorful. Right, and it's like if you go back, right? It's also Pride, right? Happy uh, Pride Month, everyone. Okay, skipping ahead. Um, this is a relatively new project. Um, uh, it's called In Terms of Performance, and it's a, it's a, essentially it's like it's like the the most text heavy um, online project because it's really about words and how they manifest. Um, but it's a kind of rolling and expanding database of terminology and language, and um, it just got started. But I think it's really interesting because it gives us a way of kind of holding on to and following right, how language changes and how terms get used and who's, who's picking them up. And it also then, you know, we can sort of think of this as a kind of mode of collection that might then at some point be really ripe for analysis, right? So if we go back into this in 10 years, what words popped up in what order? Which were the ones that were most often looked at? When did, and where did these words come from, right? If we sort of think about, you know, um, for a long time, we had our East Coast West Coast performance studies divide. You know, so you could actually trace right where those are where those are circulating. Um, this is also an area that's being picked up in um, in professional theaters, right? So this is the Battersea Art Series um, Art Center that is now using um, the tool developed by the George Mason, right, the Roy Weisenweg um, uh, Center for Digital History um, at George Mason University. They have a, an open online tool that you can use called Omeka. Um, and this basically helps you create timelines, um, can be very useful in, in, in history projects, um, but they're now using it as a way of highlighting the history of the theater and, and creating, again, a kind of documentation. And so here again, we kind of see the blur of the collection, the analysis, and, and the dissemination that, that the digital makes, um, that makes possible. Um, and this is Joanna Tompkins. Um, Digital um, three-dimensional reconstructions of performances in the Rose Theater, um, taking into account space, but also light, um, and what we know about like the sun and the position, and understanding what the lighting effects would have looked like um, in this period during during particular performances. Right, so really interesting um, um, kind of projects. Um, these are again some recent. Uh, uh, publications that I think do a, do a good job of highlighting some of these questions. Um, I would imagine that many of you are familiar with, with Deborah Kaplan's uh, Notes from the Frontier. If you're not, I encourage you to read. This is a, a review essay that came out in, in Theater Journal in 2015, um, and it marked a really uh, significant shift, I think, from theater, for theater journal, in which they, in, in addition to book reviews and performance reviews, they recognize that there is now this other space and this other venue for publication, right? Which is like digital scholarship, so works that might never pop, ne never emerge in a in a book form um, or in a printed journal, but that nevertheless are deeply in, engaged in, in, in and um, and connected to questions of theater history and theater studies and, and, and performance analysis. Um, and so she details and reviews gives a review of of four such projects. Um, and, I, and I think does a really nice job of contextualizing it. And I see this, you know, I assign this essay quite a bit. I see it as a really kind of critical marker, both in terms of the first essay that Theater Journal is publishing in this sense, but also um, to the extent that she, um, that we will come kind of back to this as these, as these projects and where they are, right, and they emerge. Um, it comes very quickly on the heels of the joint Aster Atha um, Award for Excellence in Digital Scholarship, right? So we can see that the whole field is beginning to make um, somewhat of a shift in an acknowledgement of this new kind of area. That's not to say that I think we're getting rid of journals or books anytime soon, um, but I am encouraged by the idea of creating more opportunities um, to, to examine this kind of, this kind of work. Um, and so there are a few examples here. I've, I'm, this is set done by um, uh, Jennifer Robert Smith at the University of Waterloo. Um, 
Another really important project on um, the uh, Juba project is a history of um, uh, early blackface minstrelsy in, in, in Britain and includes a number of really wonderful um, video um, and simulations. Um, I mentioned the media commons before, right? So the, um, again, this is like related to a project uh, by, um, that was started um, with Kathleen Fitzpatrick and supported by the Modern Language Association. Um, this is uh, Hamburg Dramaturgy um, uh, with a principal investigator of Wendy Ahrens at Carnegie Mellon University and a, and a team of collaborators really looking at this. Um, this is an interesting project. This is Miguel Escobar, um, uh, who did his PhD in, uh, at the University of Singapore. Um, and this is his dissertation, which was an entirely uh, digitally constructed dissertation built from scratch. Right? He basically taught himself coding in HTML so that he could build a website that would document, analyze, and present his research on um, weighing contempor, right? So contemporary shadow, Javanese um, shadow puppet theater. And it includes videos and oral, uh, uh, oral history interviews and his own analysis. Uh, and anyway, it's an extraordinary um, website that was then presented as, as, a, as his dissertation. Um, I was brought in as one of his sort of external readers uh, and, and the people at Singapore, it, it, there was like a little bit of tension about whether this would count as a dissertation. Um, and so the, the, you know, so I was brought in basically to say that it counted. <laughs> um, and I was very happy to say that it counted. Um, so I can't take any credit for helping him develop it. I came to it when it was done, right? Just to say like, why well, yes, this counts, right? Stamp of approval. Um, but it's a really extraordinary, extraordinary um, project. Um, and, and I frequently present this to people, and one of the things I say about Miguel's work is that right, he taught himself computer language a long time, a lo along with teaching himself the languages he needed in order to communicate. Right? So I mean, it, it really became a multilingual, multimodal project um, that's really an extraordinary work, um, primarily of collection right? um, and, and, and analysis. All right. Yes, so, please. So, this overview so far has been sort of the first, the first week of scholarship and, and media theory, uh, which we'll be delving in much, much greater detail, and you'll be meeting with a lot of the leading figures in these areas, and researchers, different perspectives. Uh, the second week, as I said, is going to be focusing more on performances and corporation of media, so this is going to be the shortest part of our introduction today. Um, but uh, remember, I alluded to the, that there were some exceptions that proved the rule. Of course, there had been some use of technology. And uh, so, next slide. So some of the earliest and most significant examples. Interestingly, uh, way back in 1914, uh, I mean, the initial use of, of film, as again, many of you know, uh, there weren't movie theaters. Actually, earlier on, there were like little things you'd look into. So it was going back to like using uh, a handheld. It was a one-person experience. And then, of course, there was the vaudeville circuit. So, so films were another specialty act in vaudeville. So it wasn't seen as distinct from live. It was another, what a cool thing. Um, and very early on, um, uh, we had Win uh, Winsor McKay, who was uh, one of the very first animators, not the very first, but one of the very earliest, introduced his uh, early animation of the wonderful Gertie the Dinosaur as part of a vaudeville act before it became a standalone film. So he came out as a person, and this was, of course, a film reel, but it was time to interact with him. Gertie would come out, and he would say, Gertie, please come over here. Don't do that. Here, would you like to eat something? He threw some food. Gertie would eat it. He splashed the water, and ultimately, uh, the, the, you know, uh, McKay goes backstage and then jumps onto the uh, dinosaur and rides off. So this is like really cutting edge 1990s interactive media stuff, right? <laughs> Happening right at the beginning. So it shows, it's not that people weren't capable of doing it, uh, it's the world, and this is very popular, but then you have that rift that I described uh, that prevents this kind of thing from becoming commonplace. Uh, another huge exception, of course, was Piscator. Uh, whose use of technology was completely different, much more in the way of commentary, to provide this critical perspective uh, and provide a broader uh, political, social uh, commentary on what was happening with the live performance. And that, of course, was then inspired the living newspaper in the United States. Um, and early, as many of you know, uh, those of you who are certainly in theater, Tennessee Williams, when he was doing Glass Menagerie, was inspired by Piscator and initially wanted to use projections, and that was Nick's. Um, 
So that was influential. And then, of course, in the 1950s through the early 80s, Svoboda's work uh, with media was, you know, again, very prescient. It was using film technology, but doing exactly the sorts of things that in the 90s, people like George Coates started to do um, more commonly. Uh, and some of those shows, it's actually really fascinating. I, w I was in Prague for the Performance Philosophy Conference last year. And so I went and I saw that uh, the, mat the, the circus uh, performance, which was probably his most famous, done in 1977, is still in the repertoire. Mm. And what's really intriguing to me about this, to flip back at the sort of Philoslander, uh, which is the original and which is the imitation, the live or the media, when it was first produced, of course, the big gimmick is you had the actors on film and, and you had the big images of these clowns and they would jump onto the screen and out of the screen and in and out and back and forth. So it's like, wow, there's, there are like these live actors are on the screen. Now, of course, there have been several generations of actors who have been trained to do exactly these roles. So what we see is the live performers imitating the original performers on the screen. It's like, wow, they found somebody who almost looks a little bit like the real thing, which is on the screen. So it's still in the repertoire, but it's totally transformed its significance. Um, all right, and then, of course, in the, uh, in the art, so these were in the theater world. In the art world, uh, you had the development of what soon would be called performance art uh, and experiments in art. Um, and again, ironically, a lot of performance art was very much about the body, and it was even, you know, it was, was reinforcing this rift between media and technology. But, you know, Black Mountain College in the 1950s was, uh, did famously did these wonderful, uh, they weren't called happenings yet, but events that incorporated all different you know, mixed media, including projections and images. Uh, and then in the 1960s, Billy Kluver uh, created uh, Experiments in Technology, Arts and Technology, EAT, where he would we bring together artists like Rauschenberg with, uh, with engineers to explore all sorts of uses of, at this point, usually not digital, although it's a little bit of early digital stuff, but it was usually analog technologies and live performance. Uh, and of course, Nam June Pike and people like that were, were doing this kind of work in the, in the 1960s as well. Um, so when we move into this era then of digital performance, what's really significant, some of, as I said, some of it is just bringing in, um, making it a lot easier, facilitating the sort of use of technology that could happen without the digital. Uh, but it's, I think, really useful to focus on what digital technology actually, um, what affordances um, it brings to the performance event that were almost impossible or, or inconceivable with analog technologies. And one useful thing to, to bear in mind is when digital technologies first developed, it's not that there was an inherent aversion to incorporating it into, tech, into theater, quite the opposite. I mean, as soon as we had the ability, we had electronic light boards. This is before most people had personal computers, you know, and they would, the floppies would store all the light cues, and I was actually a Broadway production, one of the first that used electronic lights and the, and the floppy was erased and they had no light cues. And they said, we'll either give you a refund or you can sit here with just, you know, house lights in the performance. But, you know, so, but, so they adopted that very early on. Uh, and of course, digital uh, audio, as soon as that became available, much easier than using the reel-to-reels. But the significant thing about those uses, even to some extent mechanics, you know, if you had a controller that could drive a motor to make a turntable go, but those were all doing exactly the same things that had been happening without the digital technology. So you couldn't tell if it worked if the light board was a computer light board or you had somebody still doing the old manual thing or if it was a you know, reel-to-reel tape or uh, a you know, digital sound. Um, so the controversy became precisely when the technology becomes part of the event. It becomes not just behind the scenes, but it's brought on stage in some way. And that, so that's the era of digital technology. Um, and so in terms of documenting this history, so as I said, in the 1990s, you really get a proliferation of this work. Uh, and then the first then histories, uh, of course, happened in the 2000s, looking back. One of the earliest was Gabriella uh, Giannacci's uh, The Virtual Theaters, which was very short uh, and one of the first attempts to sort of create the big picture. By far the most comprehensive and still sort of the Oscar Brockett of the um, digital world is Steve Dixon's digital performance, which is an amazingly comprehensive, though it's so comprehensive that he has to apologize in the beginning, saying, of course I'm not covering everything, because you might think that he is, there's so much stuff. Um, and so very, very useful resource. Uh, Chris Salter, a number of 
chapters from Entangled are part of your readings. It's another really useful, a lot of overlap between the technologies, but I actually wrote about this in Theater Journal. You can sort of look back at that. But interesting, I think there's a fundamentally different perspective that they take on it, which is very useful and interesting. Uh, and there are certain things that fit within the purview of Salter's idea of digital performance that don't fit within Dixon's and to some extent vice versa as well. But they both reinforce this narrative of starting from Wagner uh, and this sort of total theater and then moving towards the present day. Uh, and then finally, uh, Sarah Beijing and, and uh, Jen Parker Starbuck and this other guy, David Saltz, uh, created this book, so I've added, uh, which is kind of then a, a next generation because it's like a, uh, the readings that you have, it's a history of the histories sort of stepping back and, and uh, sort of problematizing because each of these tries to come up with different frameworks to fit this in and then that becomes sort of the subject of the book are the different frameworks that one might construct uh, and thinking through that for to thinking through the impact and the significance of incorporating the digital into live performance. Um, so um, this is going to be in the second week you're going to be meeting with a number of people doing both hands-on workshops, reading lots of examples, you all come with your own examples. So I'm not going to create a mini Steve Dixon for you here. But then thinking about the types of technology that go beyond simply showing a film clip. So the first most basic thing, projected video and animation, is the earliest form which could be done with a film or could be done with uh, digital technology. Then when we move into interactively generated imagery, that's something a pre-recorded film can't do. And that could be anything from motion capture to control animations in real time to controlling images with sound and all, all sorts of, or with biometrics, with you know, your heartbeat, all sorts of these sorts of events that have been happening. And then again, that started starting in the late 80s. You have the beginnings of this kind of interactive work. Uh, and a lot of it came out of uh, music initially. So we were creating alternate musical interfaces, but then they were triggering images. So it immediately breaks down the whole definition of you know, music versus dance, because you've got the movement, you've got, uh, so suddenly instead of just a performer who's sort of invisible playing the music, you've got somebody who's moving to create images and sound together. So I'm simultaneously a composer and a dancer and a choreographer. Um, so all of those things become one. So it radically transforms the whole nature of the event and even the definition of what kind of event it is. Uh, telematics, so the ability then to bring together uh, performers from around the world into one place. Um, uh, robotics in performance, and we'll be talking a bit about that later on. Uh, great examples, and I know at least one of you does the robotic work. Um, Telerobotics, which brings them both together. Um, so and there's been a lot of work. I published an article a while ago that looked in performance research focusing on telerobotics and, and collaborative uh, identity, uh, where you actually have somebody in one location controlling <laughs> A robot, sort of like the you know a Mar the Mars rover, is telerobotic, and people have used that in performance contexts. Uh, immersive virtual reality, which goes back to this singular you know one person with their media. Uh, then you, you get augmented reality, which instead of being lost in my virtual world, you go out in the world, and suddenly the media is imposed on the world around you. Which even more broadly, locative media, media, which can also be you know sound, uh, visual but out in the world that you bring with you. Pokemon Go is the most sort of popular uh, example of that in the commercial world. Uh, and then finally, distributed and collaborative environments. Uh, so this is where, like for example, with immersive virtual reality, increasingly I can be in my own little world, but interacting, I know that Alicia did a lot of work with Second Life, so that kind of environment. So you're, in, in, you're interacting with real people in real time in this virtual world. Uh, and there are millions of very radically different types of performative events that can be created within that kind of technology. Um, all right, so that ends that part of it. So in, in terms of kind of synthesizing and pulling all this together, right, what we've done is to create, uh, you know, a series of, of you know, modules, I guess we might call them, um, that sort of looks at the different aspects of these broader Contexts of mediated performance, digital performance, and, and the intersection with digital scholarship and theater and performance studies. So, this is a, a essentially the outline of uh, of the institute, right? And sort of the topics that we'll we'll work through. Um, there's a, a kind of 
rough order to them, right, in terms of thinking about scholarship in the first week and performance um, techniques in the second. Um, but I think you'll find, you know, like I did with my mistaking of visualization and simulation, right, that the boundaries become quite blurry. And I think one of the goals that we have for the Institute is not to impart a body of knowledge or uh, a series of, of tools and tasks and skills, but is more to facilitate your uh, thinking about how, what are the resources to help you with the projects that you are most invested in? What are the questions that will come out of these two weeks? Um, what might you expand and where might the resources be? Again, taking into consideration that we're at different kinds of institutions. Some institutions support this stuff really well, some don't, right? And so we've been very mindful to think about how to leverage that. So by the end of the two weeks, you will have, everyone should have, right, a robust project or an idea, at least conceptual, um, for how they might go forward with, with uh, a DH in theater and performance studies project, um, as well as, uh, methods and, th and thinking about in its syllabus for how might you like construct a class or build this into one of your existing classes. And one thing I might to, to, to expand on that just a little bit, uh, also our hope is in developing these projects, on the one hand there's, there's the distinct possibility in the way we're going to be structuring the working groups, uh, it's going to be encouraging at least temporary collaborations among you guys creating projects. So you know it would be wonderful if we ended up with some lasting collaborations that emerged from this, so it might be that there are certain institutions that can do this and others that provide that resource and you come together and you get your Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, bringing them together. But also you might simply walk away saying, I have this great idea for this project, I can do this piece, I need somebody else to do this piece of that piece, and then you know exactly what you're looking for and you can find the collaborators to make that happen. So there are really you know, very few limits if you, if, uh, you think of it in a collaborative way. Uh, you can make almost anything happen. Any questions on that? And we'll have opportunities for yes. discussion and, and such later, but just in there, so there's anything immediate. Questions, thoughts, objections, other ways of thinking about some of the things that we talked about? Yes? Well, I mean, the history, when you do history, it's always hard, and we do it one, two, three, and we know it's not one, two, three, it's next, right? But it, but it really is um, Western, you yeah. know? And just, that, just to intersect that, there were, if you looked at the Cultural Revolution in the 70s, it was distributed by film, you know. And just that any of the categories can be sort of, we've already said they can be exploded. But, so that's one aspect. But the other one, I was really thinking of how the machinery changed, you know, and how that also changed how we physically perform. And how much, um, like right now, we're all with, with, with our, our, um, our, you know, handheld apparatus, but when, you know, you first, I don't know if you all remember when you first encountered a computer, I was, I was just blown away, you know, and, and what a screen was. So just to be thinking about how the, the actual objects were, even though, you know, we say, well, it's virtual, the, the objects themselves are part of that theatricality of performing the, the digital, yeah. else? Yes. I wonder where we would put, um, kind of, you know, in response to Catherine's point, I remember the, I think it was the first time I encountered a computer was in a classroom environment. Yeah, I was very young at the time. I was in preschool, I think. In my, probably my first three, four, five years of, of performative interaction with computers was always about testing how well I could do various kinds of academic things. Where would we put the more disciplinary, uh, utilitarian, quantifiably, you know, sort of getting you into your educational tracks, getting you into your jobs? Where would we put there? And I've, and I've got in mind uh, things like John Erickson's performer else, right? So right. That's, that's what I've got in my mind. Where would we, we put this? Yeah. Right. Do you want to feel that? Yeah, I mean, I think that. Uh, I think that's a, a little bit of a parallel track to, to what we've been thinking about here, but certainly not um, like in a Foucauldian sense alien at all, right? I mean, like the, and, and that's what Mackenzie highlights, right? That, that digital technologies become a different kind of discipline and, and disciplinary um, activity. We see them everywhere in, in, uh, in different kinds of uh, 
behavioral shaping, right? For lack of a better word, I'm sure there's a better phrase. But if you sort of think about the ways in which uh, algorithms now mine your data, um, assess you as an individual, right, user on the web, and then use that assessment as a way of further changing your behavior, right? So they figure out what it is that you want to buy, and then they try to sell you more of that, and then they try to, you know, um, uh, the, you know, psychologists have been deeply involved in advertising for a long time, and they're now deeply involved at, at most big tech companies, right? There are, there, you don't have to rely on, me, you know, messy things like focus groups when you can do, like, you know, psychometrics and, and real deep analysis and know people better than they know themselves, right? There's something like, you know, like the data points of Google can predict you better than, and your behavior better than your spouse, for example. So, so I think that there's, there's certainly, and of course we shouldn't ignore, you know, precisely the history of these, uh, of these devices, right, which come out of the military, right? right. As do most of our digital technologies, yeah. right? Yeah. They are almost all initially funded through DARPA. Um, they are cultivated for very specific um, military um, uh, uses, <clears throat> predominantly in this country, but certainly globally as well. Um, and, and cyber warfare is only going to become a more prevalent, right, and, and salient aspect of contemporary culture going forward, right? Um, there was just a thing, I think, in the, in the Washington Post or The Guardian this morning that, um, that the U.S. government is now um, focused more on aggressive cyber, um, uh, cyber warfare rather than a defensive monitoring and waiting for, for attacks, right? So, so that's a whole dimension. So, um, which is a long way from, from Mike's preschool days, I, I grant you, um, but becomes a kind of educational, uh, you know, disciplinary activity. I think the, the fear that a lot of us have um, when we start hearing um, academic and educational institutions talking about like digital assessment and training is that, uh, that our control and that the standardization um, is gonna take over, right? Um, and that assessment is gonna be done either algorithmically or through machine learning and in ways that we can't necessarily assess or understand it. Uh, and I think, and that, that frankly is a fear that has been with us since the 1950s, right? If you, um, you know, Norbert Wiener publishes Cybernetics in 1948. By 1954, Jacques Ellul, a French sociologist, is freaking out about the quantification of daily life and how this is gonna sh radically shape and transform society. Um, in a book called The Technological Society, right, where he talks about that everything is going to become quantifiable and we're all going to be measured by mathematics and it will be the end of social culture as we know it, right? And again, 1954, right? So this is not a new, um, a, a new fear at, at, at all, but I think it does. Um, so just to kind of get to your, your, your question, Mike, I think this, this a little bit runs in a, kind of, in a kind of parallel, but by no means in isolation. Um, and I think as we think about our roles not just as scholars, but as educators, you know, what is it that we are helping our students do? How do they interact with it? How do they learn this history? Um, and, and, and what presumptions do we make when we formulate digital projects, when we insist on certain kinds of outcomes or outputs or um, require students to work in a certain kind of process, not un un unlike your preschool classroom? And I would actually, in addition, another interesting uh, connection, particularly we're bringing up Mackenzie's Perform or Else, uh, has, as I'm thinking about it, has an inter intersection with a lot of work that's being done now uh, in surveillance and in technologies, sure. but also in, in Chris Salter's uh, ideas about performance. Uh, the idea that technology performs. So we like to think about technology as something that we use to empower ourselves, but again, it works both ways. Uh, so the tech, you know, it, one of the key ideas in, in uh, Mackenzie's book is this idea of performance in the sense of a high performance computer or performing well in business, that it, it imposes a certain kind of discipline. And, uh, and Chris Salter talks, goes back to Meyerhold and talks about the way Meyerhold's biomechanics put, makes people into, using the ideas of Taylor, puts people into uh, a kind of machine technological structure. So we're stripped of our autonomy and we're stripped of our agency and we become you know, part of this technology. So that's something that I think we need to be highly conscious of and critical about. And a lot of interesting digital performance, going right back to George Coates, uh, was actually, his work, you know, was actually, though it was seen as very pro-technology because he got money from Silicon Valley to do it, his actual performances were often highly critical very early on in the 90s mm -hmm. about uh, 
the way the technology is stripping us from our, our, our agency and, and uh, uh, forcing us to conform to both corporate and military sort of ideas and models. We'll continue to kind of explore some of those ideas um, you know, over the next couple of weeks. Shall we take a five yes. minute kind of- Or 10, well, we start at 10.30, 10, right? Okay. So we got 10. We'll take a 10 minute kind of break. Um, if you miss them on your way, yes, Jason? Well, I just had a, a reminder about the Ramsey Center Athletic uh, Boards. I'll collect those at lunchtime as well uh, with the money deposits and stuff that go with that. And if you miss it on your way in, the desserts from last night are on the table down in the lobby if the digital music kids haven't managed to track them down. So, um, so I encourage you to go and, and do that. Also, if you are in need of lunches or dinners, I have a refrigerator full of chicken and potato in Tupperware. Um, so you should like let me know. I am happy to distribute. We also have an uh, enormous leftover. salad, a lot of salad. Indeed, we have leftover salad from, anyway, so from last night as well. Anyway, so salad from last night as well. Anyway, so salad from last night as well. Anyway, so salad from last night as well. Anyway, so